As I said in my introductory remarks this morning, the specific issue that we want to address today is uh, Russia's accession to the WTO and the consequent need for legislation here in the United States to provide permanent normal trade relations for Russia, uh, eliminate the jackson bannock Amendment, and restore normal trade relations between our two countries. Um, we have prepared a uh, comprehensive report on that topic here at the Institute. My colleagues Anders Oslin, our Russia expert, and Gary Huffbauer, our trade policy expert, have gotten together to prepare a document that uh, analyzes the underlying economics of the trade relations between the two countries, what WTO accession and PNGR would mean, the costs and benefits of going ahead with it for both Russia and particularly for the United States. Uh, the administration has repeatedly said in recent weeks that this issue is very much front and center on their trade policy agenda for the year. It probably has to await passage of the three free trade agreements before it will be sent to the Congress. Uh, but again, the administration has said repeatedly they want to get it done this year, they intend to get it done this year, always, of course, premised on the completion of WTO accession itself. Uh, but the issue is teed up, and we think over the next few months it will be moving toward action and therefore a need for widespread understanding of the issue itself, what it would mean for the U.S. economy in particular, and what the case is for moving ahead with the legislation. Um, the, um, uh, the report that we've prepared is at this stage still in uh, preliminary form. Uh, that's because we want to wait for final publication until we get close to the actual congressional action so we can play into the finally released version uh, the most up-to-date information, the final developments, both in the economies and in the legislative picture itself. Um, but the version that will be presented to you today is, uh, is complete as of now. Uh, we're simply going to update it further before we finally release it and uh, put it out for the congressional debate. So uh, the presentations, uh, our, our speakers have PowerPoint presentations, so they won't go up to the table until after uh, the initial uh, uh, presentations. Uh, Andres Oslin, Gary Huffbauer will present the report. We'll then have two commentators, Ed Verona from the U.S. Russia Business Council, who will bring us a kind of business perspective, uh, some suggestions of where things stand in the Congress right now, and what the scenario looks like evolving for addressing the PNTR issue. Stanislav Roksoshinsky, the Deputy Minister of Economic Development for Russia, will then uh, comment from the Russian perspective what this may mean for the investment climate and trade relationships in Russia itself. Uh, in the earlier panel, Sergei Guryev mentioned a couple of times the importance of PNTR and WTO accession for Russia's reform prospects. Um, we've known for some time that involvement in the global trading system can provide a very positive impetus to economic reform and future economic progress. Uh, the most not noteworthy recent case of WTO accession was, of course, China's uh, a little over 10 years ago when their leadership very deliberately joined the WTO in order to promote economic reform within the country. The Jiang Zemin Zhuo and Xi team used that very extensively and I think very effectively and indeed brilliantly to improve economic reform and the economic performance of China. Uh, question, can that be replicated in Russia? The other comparison with that earlier experience is that uh, after a, a very active debate, the US Congress did pass PNTR for China. Uh, there are some today who say that was a mistake uh, and that the issue ought to be revisited and we certainly don't want to, quote, make that mistake again. Um, I don't agree with that view. I don't think my colleagues agree with that view, but we know it's a view that will be expressed quite actively in the congressional debate over PNTR for Russia. And therefore, our report, the kind of discussion that we're trying to uh, stimulate today, will be very important in paving the way, hopefully, for positive uh, 
policy action in the United States on this issue. So, uh, my colleagues, Andres and Gary, leading off with Gary to present the uh, report that we've prepared, comments from Ed and uh, our Russian colleague, uh, and we will then open up for general discussion. Gary. Uh, thanks very much, Fred. Uh, and as Fred mentioned or emphasized, this is a draft, and we call it a policy analysis because it's not very brief. Um, and in these, in just a few minutes uh, that I have, I'm going to skim over quite lightly uh, the content. So I hope it's enough of a interest to whet your appetite to, to read it. Uh, more fully when you have time. And we will appreciate comments because, as Fred said, it's a work in progress. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of help on this, uh, especially our two Julias here in the Institute, Dean DeRosa. Uh, Jeff Schott had to read the whole manuscript and comment on it. So uh, we even listed a lot of people uh, in, uh, in helping this. And, and I, I want to acknowledge that Anders took the the lead hand on this. He's our Russia expert. Uh, right up front, you will see that we, we emphasize we do not deal in this policy analysis with the foreign policy dimensions that loom so large and that will loom so large in the congressional debate, uh, which, uh, which, which Fred mentioned. Um, I, I hope that Ed Verona will speak to those. Um, this is really an economics. Uh, brief, and that's what we uh, are going to, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. So, a lot of it is qualitative gain, and uh, the first point uh, that I think we should emphasize in this period of, you could say, uncertainty in the trading system is that accession will prevent Russia from arbitrarily raising tariffs and invoking non-tariff barrier uh, measures in the future. I believe Minister Kudrin said that Russia hadn't done that. That's at variance with the research that we have done, in, and it's posted on the website and another brief on G20 protectionism in the, um, in the wake of the Great Recession. We found that by, by count, and this is not the amount of protection, but just the number of incidents. Actually, Russia led all G20 countries in number of protectionist incidents. Uh, so there, there's a lot of tariffs that were raised and other stuff that came along and so forth. And uh, this uh, WTO accession would uh, preclude that in the future. And that is a very big qualitative gain or insurance policy going forward. And importantly, Apart from the uh, political dimension, which uh, Ed Verona will probably emphasize, uh, this will put uh, U.S.-Russian relations on a much friendlier uh, and sounder commercial, you know, basis going forward, and and that has something to do with uh, a lot of big-ticket items uh, that uh, will come along, and smaller issues that will arise in the future. Now. Turning to the quantitative side of the picture, uh, you'll find in the in the policy analysis uh, schedule, uh, in fact, detailed schedules of the what seems like the likely drop in the Russian tariff schedule, and a whole wide range of regulatory reforms that come in. Um, the record in the recent past has been a doubling. We assume going forward in this policy analysis that there will be a strong Russian economy. So let me say a word about that. We're essentially assuming uh, Professor Guryev's, Sergey Guryev's optimistic scenario, the 6% growth, not the 4% growth. And that means that we're assuming dramatic reforms going forward. And we think uh, membership in the WTO can be a component, not, not the most important component, but a component of the reform agenda, hopefully going forward in Russia. 
privatization, the investment climate, the judicial system, continuation of macro stability. Now, with this, uh, we think that uh, going forward, uh, U.S. merchandise exports to Russia could uh, could double from the, the level before the Great Recession, uh, so might reach 19 billion. Services exports are a tremendously uh, great potential for the U.S. economy and uh, right across the board. In fact, that is the, the frontier of the next decade. Uh, other work done by our colleague Brad Jensen has some dramatic results there. Uh, and we think that service exports to Russia could at least double and, and probably more. We also see a substantial boost in foreign direct investment. It was mentioned that um, inward foreign direct investment in, in Russia is in the neighborhood of 50, 60 billion. Uh, our figures indicate that U.S. is about 20 billion, of which uh, the non oil portion is about 7 billion, and it's that non-oil portion which might grow, up, grow most dramatically in the future. Now, <clears throat> thanks to the hard work of Dean DeRosa who's here, uh, we uh, put, used our gravity model to try to look at the future. Uh, one way, there are other ways of looking at the future, and we introduced a fair amount of qualitative uh, uh, other considerations besides the gravity model. Um, but the gravity model uh, looks at bilateral trade in terms of a mass of variables of which distance and size of the economies are the dominant ones, and we use that to uh, project uh, what things might look like once uh, Russia joins the WTO. Uh, we uh, focused on aggregate merchandise trade at a one-digit level. That's pretty broad categories like food, beverages, tobacco. Um, and we take into account the impact of inward foreign direct investment that is into Russia uh, on trade. Now, I know there are some people <laughs> who wrongly think that when the U.S. invests abroad, that takes jobs away from the United States and reduces our exports. That is one of the biggest errors in the policy debate here in the United States right now, and not just Russia. I mean, it's a more general error, but it is a major error. And in fact, foreign direct investment abroad by U.S. firms increases U.S. exports, increases employment in this country. So that's a, that's a plus. Uh, the fundamental variables in the gravity model are there, and uh, including the joint membership in the WTO. Now, here are some statistics. I'm not going to dwell on these, these coefficients, but they are described in detail in the, in the policy analysis if your appetite has been whetted. And uh, it, it just shows kind of what's important and, and how, uh, how the, the uh, statistics map out. And it's based on a very large panel of data. <clears throat> now, the results come in quite quickly is that with the gravity model, we uh, can explain a substantial portion of trade uh, just using the standard coefficients in the gravity model, the ones I just portrayed. Uh, you would get an accession ra raising two-way manufacturer's trade by 20 percent, and you get an additional increase in trade through the foreign direct investment route. For reasons that we explain in some detail in the policy brief, we think these results are too conservative, and uh, they do reflect uh, a, uh, a negative fixed effects coefficient. I know this is pretty technical in the weeds, but a negative fixed effects coefficient between U.S. and Russian trade, which, you know, obviously reflects a lot of history there, uh, political history. And uh, we uh, did some other calculations, uh, putting that fixed effects coefficient to zero, and that that's the basis on which we say there could be a, uh, a, uh, a doubling of, uh, <coughs> of, of trade between our, uh, between our countries as a result of uh, WTO accession. Now, just very quickly, and this is the end of my comments, uh, we tried to identify, the, there you get a very summary snapshot on the tariffs, 
schedules before and after, and these are still being negotiated in some of their details. Uh, these are Russian tariffs, and, and now let me back up. Uh, I'm reminded by what Fred said on the China debate. Very much like China, Russia does all the heavy lifting in the, in the political sense of reducing its barriers. The U.S. does very little on the commercial side, does nothing on the commercial side in terms of reducing our barriers to Russia as a result of Russia's accession to the WTO. So in that sense, it's a replay of China, but there are other senses in which it, is, it will not be a replay of China, and Anders will talk about those. So Russian tariffs go down significantly. Naturally, we like to see them lower, but it's a big drop. It's a good start. And then you get the kind of industries which look like being big winners from a U.S. perspective. And by big winners, I mean more market access into Russia, and the details are in the, uh, in the policy analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to do this together with Gary because he knows so much about uh, uh, trade policy. What I'll do here will be uh, something quite simple. I will try to give you some uh, statistical peculiarities that uh, people are not well aware of, which uh, means that uh, uh, most of the concerns that are being raised about Russia uh, uh, joining the WTO and um, uh, with uh, normal trading relations for uh, Russia are not really problems that we should be uh, concerned with. And I'll focus on three points, three theses. One is, uh, has already been made. U.S.-Russia trade is inordinately small. Uh, it will grow, but it will stay comparatively uh, small. Today, Russia is only the 37th export market of the United States. Lots can be accomplished here. The other point is that Russia is the richest and most developed uh, uh, country, but uh, it is less dynamic. And uh, my main point in the end is R Russia could hardly be more different from China in all the relevant uh, uh, regards in trade policy. But let me give you a few nice pictures uh, that I think. Here on the left hand side you see um, billions of current dollars and you can see uh, uh, how uh, Russia increased its GDP in current dollar terms from 200 billion dollars uh, in 99 to more than 1.6 trillion in 2008. So this was a massive rise, an increase by eight times in uh, nine years. And then, of course, you feel that you walk on water because you do walk on water. <laughs> and uh, in real terms, you can also see what, what uh, particularly Alexei Kudrin talked about. Uh, on the uh, right-hand side, you have a growth rate, a real growth rate in percent. 7% growth uh, for 10 years on average, and then a sharp fall by almost 8% in, um, in uh, 2009, the biggest decline of any uh, G20 economy, and after that, a quite a poor recovery of 4%, and now Russia seems to be stuck on a, a growth of 3 to 4%. And behind this lies um, uh, oil and gas incomes. And here you see Russian, and, uh, Russian oil and gas production. Uh, and it has uh, stagnated both since 2004, which happens to be uh, just after the Yukos affair, which uh, put an end to an extraordinary recovery uh, on, in the uh, oil, oil sector. And the conclusion of this is that uh, Russian growth now is very much dependent on the oil price, as uh, heavily emphasized in the last section, and uh, on the growth of other sectors. So Russia has to move out of it. So therefore, I don't think that the oil curse 
uh, will be there for long. Russia is not a real extreme petrostate. As you uh, might have heard uh, Alexei Kudrin said, uh, oil and gas now account for 19% of GDP. So Russia has to move on. And then uh, Alexei Kudrin also mentioned how small US-Russia trade is. And in these two pictures, you see that EU accounts for almost half of Russia's trade, while the United States is at uh, uh, three and four percent of Russia's uh, uh, export and import. And this uh, are the numbers uh, for last uh, years. But what I think is particularly interesting is uh, this picture. Here we have compiled the main numbers for the, the BRIC uh, countries. And what stands out here is that um, Russia in the per capita terms is much richer than the other BRICs, including Brazil, which uh, people are not fully uh, aware of, and of course far ahead of China. So Russia has a, a GDP per capita that is still almost three times higher than, uh, than China's. And unlike the other uh, the countries, it has a stagnant uh, uh, or declining po uh, popu uh, population. And uh, you can see how strikingly small the two-way trade with uh, uh, the United uh, States uh, is in comparison uh, with not only China, of course, but also with uh, uh, Brazil and India. So this is a, a totally disproportionate uh, situation. And uh, you... The general perception is that uh, uh, FDI, foreign direct investment, is small in Russia, which is true if you take it as a share of uh, GDP. But if you take it as uh, FDI stock per capita, measured in dollars, it's at the level of Brazil, and it's uh, many times higher than in China uh, and India. So, of course, the investment climate should be much better but Russia is not doing as uh, badly in these uh, regards. And where Russia is um, uh, really strong, it is when it comes to uh, tertiary education. I'm uh, here using the UNESCO uh, numbers, and you can see that Russia, uh, which uh, suggests that uh, young people have got some tertiary, that is some college education, and, uh, these numbers are generally higher than uh, other uh, indicators of tertiary indicators. Uh, but Russia is very high. If you take instead uh, uh, college graduation, Russia is 51% to compare with 35% for the United States. So Russia has a huge potential here, even if much of its education is of uh, poor uh, quality. And uh, uh, then let me just take this picture. This is another picture of showing how small uh, Russia's share of U.S. exports is. Uh, we have here taken numbers from uh, 2008. And while the average for big countries, we have taken out Mexico and Canada here as neighbors, we are totally... Uh, uh, <clears throat> inappropriate, uh, with very high numbers. And, but for the other countries, you see that Russia has the least uh, U.S. exports of any of these uh, 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 17 uh, big, big economies. And uh, uh, it has uh, only 0.6% uh, uh, of U.S. exports as a uh, in relation to its GDP, while the average for these countries is 2%. Uh, so you can say that the natural uh, thing would be that Russia, uh, that US exports to Russia triple, if it would become proportional. Of course, it is not uh, uh, the whole truth, but it's uh, one indicator of uh, the unutilized uh, potential. So let me then finally take uh, uh, the comparison between Russia and China. How does it, uh, Russia differ from uh, China in, in uh, 
uh, WTO uh, context. First of all, Russia is much richer. It's a much uh, uh, wealthier, more well-educated uh, country. Therefore, uh, and at the other, on the other hand, 90% of Russia's exports are commodities. But the conclusion here is that Russia is not ma uh, competitive in manufacturing, nor is it likely uh, to be so. Uh, the one uh, important modern industry where Russia is strong is software. But uh, Russia's software industry is focused on the higher end of uh, software production. So it's not cheap programming. And uh, therefore, the Russian software industry is anxious to maintain good standards of intellectual property rights. So it's a positive force for intellectual property rights uh, uh, rather than a ne negative one. And <clears throat> And then we have a current account uh, issue. Uh, Alexei Kudrin did not quite talk about it today, but his view is that Russia has two large reserves. And you could hear uh, Alexei Ulyukhaev uh, speak about it. Russia has no policy of increasing its reserves, unlike China. Russia has no policy of maintaining uh, uh, any particular exchange rate. On the, uh, on the contrary, uh, Russia has a floating exchange rate now and is um, uh, letting the exchange rate rise in order to control, uh, control inflation. So also here, there is no comparison. And Russia has still a large current account uh, uh, deficit, which it is intent on, uh, on reducing. Uh, you could hear the difference uh, in the two previous uh, sessions from the American debate. In the American debate, you e only hear the discussion about the need for exports. Here, you heard uh, virtually everybody saying that Russia's need is to ha get more imports in order to get more competition and uh, uh, to get more economic uh, growth uh, by getting relevant uh, machinery. You can hardly imagine uh, a more sensible um, uh, uh, partner for the United States uh, to, to join in the World Trade Organization. And with that, I have... Actually, the current account surplus is set to decline. Sorry, sorry, my full fault. Current account uh, surplus uh, is set to the decline. Thank you for pointing it out, Fred. <laughs> Start us off with your comments. Uh, thank you very much, Fred, for the uh, invitation to speak here. It's a great honor and privilege to uh, share the podium with two such distinguished economists as Anders and Gary. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, the USRBC is a Washington-based trade organization whose mission is to promote trade and investment between uh, our two countries. Uh, we are also the umbrella for the Coalition for U.S.-Russia Trade, uh, which is uh, led very capably by Randy Levinas, uh, the Executive Vice President of the USRBC. And its purpose is uh, to advocate for Russia's accession to the WTO and the measures that have to be taken here in the United States uh, to take full benefit of that from a business perspective. Um, in the last three months, maybe a little longer, uh, we, that is the USTR, USRBC and the uh, coalition, uh, along with uh, a number of the people here in the room, have been paying visits on uh, Capitol Hill to some members, uh, staff, uh, and staff of uh, the committees of jurisdiction over trade matters as well as uh, foreign affairs. And what we have found uh, in our many meetings, 71 of them all together, um, is that it has been so long since Russia 
was discussed in a trade context on the Hill that many members and staffers are simply not familiar with the paramount issues, Jackson Vanek particularly, and its implications for U.S. business. Uh, since the last big debate on PNTR, uh, much alluded to here, the, uh, the, the Chinese accession in 2001, uh, there has been quite a turnover in Congress. So many of the people uh, who, uh, many of the, the, the freshmen uh, simply aren't as uh, um, up to speed on, on many of those trade issues, and so there's an educational process involved. Um, and Russia itself has not been uh, a topic of discussion in trade matters for some time. Uh, Jackson Vanek has been waived by the executive branch now every year since 1994, um, and members have not had uh, a great deal of direct involvement in that process. So as a result, um, when we go up on the Hill, we're doing, a, a, I think, a pretty uh, hefty job of trying to educate in, a, in, in the course of a 30, 40 minute meeting uh, on all that's happened over, let's say, 20 years in U.S.-Russia trade relations. What has struck me um, is just how little people understand what Jackson Vanek is. Um, and most importantly, that it does not constitute a veto on Russia's accession to the WTO. Um, and I would say, parenthetically, uh, about three weeks ago, Congressman uh, Levin was here, ranking member of the House Ways and Means Committee, and a man will have much to say about, about this issue, um, uh, said that, very frankly, Jackson Vanek is the only handle we have on our negotiations with Russia. Um, and I thought, I, 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 uh, it's hard for me to imagine that he isn't aware of the fact that this is something that is entirely within the executive branch's uh, purview. Um, so we're trying to raise awareness of that fact. Uh, the key points we're trying to make is it does not constitute a veto or any leverage over the administration in its negotiations of WTO accession. Um, the Jackson Vanek becomes relevant to business and to Congress uh, once Russia uh, accedes to the WTO. And if it is still in effect when that occurs, the U.S. must issue uh, what I understand is called, a formal language, an application of non-extension of permanent normal trade relations to Russia. Um, and Russia, in, 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 in reciprocity, would be under no obligation to extend PNTR or most favored nation status to the United States in the context of its WTO membership. Uh, this creates a paradox. Uh, the U.S. will have carried out a very tough negotiating process uh, now over 17 years and got the very best deal it could uh, for American business, and yet we would not be able to fully take advantage of the opportunities that that creates. And it would put American companies at a very serious competitive disadvantage to companies from other countries which could immediately extend uh, PNTR MFN, notably companies from the EU and Japan. And this some, has come as a surprise to some people um, on the Hill. Um, there's also some resistance uh, due to the belief that maybe any signal on Jackson Vanek somehow undermines the uh, negotiating authority of the administration. And I think, well, we've got a representative here of the administration who can tell us whether or not they believe that that does constitute uh, any form of sort of um, subtle uh, leverage. Um, regarding the general attitude toward Russia's WTO accession, we've encountered three typical views. <clears throat> and Fred Bernstein. Uh, mention this, uh, China. China's always raised. Uh, we gave PNTR to China, and, uh, and well, it doesn't fully abide by its commitments, and people are afraid that uh, Russia will somehow behave in a similar manner. Uh, another objection, Russia simply doesn't deserve to be a member of the WTO. We heard that also from Congressman Levin here three weeks ago. Uh, Russia's track record of human rights violations um, is um, a, a, a matter of headline reporting. A State Department report on human rights has just been issued and will no doubt fuel that sentiment. Russia's backsliding on democracy is a concern on the Hill. Um, and others think Russia has not been cooperative or as cooperative as it should be on major geopolitical issues, particularly on uh, non-proliferation regimes, i.e. Iran. Um, and third, 
uh, this has nothing to do with Russia, but everything to do with our own internal legislative processes. Some members don't want to discuss Jackson Vanek and PNTR for Russia until Congress uh, takes action uh, to adopt, approve, ratify uh, the three pending free trade agreements with Colombia, Panama, and South Korea. This isn't aimed at Russia. I hope no Russians assume that somehow they are being put behind the queue after three other countries that uh, they may feel are in a different category. It's, it is uh, a, a reflection of uh, our own uh, in democratic processes and perhaps the impasse we're at in, uh, in our trade negotiations. So how do we respond to these assertions? Well, regarding China's adherence to its commitments, um, I would point out that their economies are starkly different, and Anders has already said this. Uh, it misses the point to draw parallels between the two. Russia exports crude oil, refined products, metals, in some cases semi-elaborated steel products, but, um, but very few manufacturers. Uh, maybe in addition to the software that you mentioned, uh, Anders, uh, their most successful manufactured exports doesn't come, don't come under the scope of WTO. It's weapons, and we buy very few of them, uh, so, uh, so it, it, it's, not, it's not relevant. So there's no threat of this massive influx of goods that would um, destroy American jobs, as some might describe it, uh, as occurred with, with China, allegedly. Um, with respect to the concerns about Russia's protection of intellectual property rights and some other trade-related issues, um, you know, our point is, are we better off with Russia inside the WTO, where um, its compliance uh, with, uh, with its commitments can be monitored, and if they are deficient in some regard, that uh, there's the possibility of bringing them uh, to a dispute resolution panel where we may get some redress of those concerns. Uh, with regard to the argument that Russia does not deserve to be a member of the WTO for political reasons, um, I think we have to go back to what the original purpose of Jackson Vanek was. Uh, it was to encourage the Soviet Union to allow free immigration of peoples, particularly Jews, from Russia. Today, Russia has a visa-free travel regime with Israel. Um, and I suspect, although I don't have any statistics to corroborate it, but I suspect that there are more Russian Jewish emigres working in Russia today, albeit with, with other passports, than there are Russian Jews trying to leave Russia, not trying, who, who wish to. Um, and, I, and we have Mark Levin here from the National Council of Soviet Jewry, uh, who is a strong supporter of what we're trying to do, and I think maybe he could provide maybe some anecdotal evidence of that as well. Um, the conditions stipulated in Jackson Vanek have been satisfied, and from my point of view, there's a danger that failure to give credit to Russia for having uh, removed or for having uh, uh, accomplished what Jackson Vanek aimed to achieve, uh, that we undermine the credibility of such legislation in the future. Um, if there's no incentive for other governments, no credible belief that once they satisfy the condition of that type of legislation, um, then there will be very little reason for them to, uh, to abide by it. Um, out of respect for our own belief in the rule of law, um, I think it is something that should be removed. We uh, run the risk of setting a bad precedent when we artificially apply a standard for purposes other than those for which they were intended. Jackson Vanek was, for, was a, a intended to increase the movement of peoples. That's occurred. It was never intended to be a negotiating tool in, in, in trade negotiations, at least by my understanding. And finally, with respect to the crowded trade agenda before Congress, we point out, or I would point out, that uh, as a business organization, we fully support the other FTAs, um, and we welcome their early adoption. Uh, we simply believe that Jackson Vanek uh, shouldn't be a very heavy lift once those three uh, FTAs have been approved. And, um, and it's so clearly in our national interest. There's a lot at stake from a strictly trade perspective. Even though our volume of uh, exports is relatively small, as, as has been pointed out by the study, it's grown very significantly over the last decade at a rate of about 20% per annum. Um, there's reason to believe uh, and I think, I think your extrapolations are, are um, pretty much, I mean, uh, very optim optimistic, not unrealistically so, um, suggests that, that, that over the next decade we can see uh, considerably greater growth for a potential for American exports as Russia invests in physical infrastructure, as it upgrades its communications, particularly broadband 
communications and the technical uh, uh, equipment that's required for that. And as more and more Russians enter uh, the middle class and begin to buy more and more high quality American products uh, that for them in many ways are emblematic of a modern uh, prosperous lifestyle. And as more and more Russians enter uh, the middle class and begin to buy more and more high quality American products uh, that for them in many ways are emblematic of a modern uh, prosperous lifestyle. But there are other reasons to support WTO accession. Bringing Russia into conformity with the rules of the world's largest trading organization creates confidence and predictability as companies develop their long-term export plans for Russia. And without WTO, there's no recourse for companies that find themselves suddenly facing an increase in a tariff or some non-tariff barrier. Um, there's no consequence for Russia if it does that, even though we do have a, a, a protocol uh, extending most favored nation status. Once inside the WTO, Russia will be obligated to explain, justify, and ultimately defend and rectify uh, actions that it takes that are not consistent with its WTO obligations. And we think there could be other benefits as well, maybe more psychological. It creates the, 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 the assurance for many investors that Russia is prepared to uh, submit to a set of, of uh, externally driven rules um, and that this is going to be good for the Russian economy overall and good for foreign investors. And it will, I think, and this is important, maybe uh, it's the geopolitical aspect that uh, you alluded to, um, it will constitute a victory of sorts for those within Russia who have been striving to modernize and diversify their economy to uh, affect uh, rule of law and to make Russia more closely integrated with its trading partners uh, in the West. Uh, here's my big concern, that the window of opportunity to accomplish WTO session is narrowing. Uh, I believe, and I know that some other senior U.S. government officials believe, and, and many uh, uh, independent observers, that it, if it doesn't happen this year, there's a real risk that it won't happen for another decade or more. Uh, Russia's going to have Duma elections in December. There will be presidential elections in both countries uh, in 2012. And political pressure is building within Russia to, um, to provide protection for their, for their infant industries. And that will probably only grow as those elections approach. Um, so Jackson Vanek, while it doesn't stay in the, stand in the way of an accession process, certainly will hurt American companies if and when Russia gets in, which we hope it does. It has served its purpose and it is time to acknowledge that and to lift it with regard to Russia. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Sounds off? Sure, whatever you prefer. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and let me use this opportunity to brief you on what we are doing to encourage investment in my country and particularly to improve investment climate. But first of all, let me tell you one personal story. When I was a, and I'll explain why, uh, later why I'm telling this. When I was a school student in the age of, I think, 11 or 12, once I got a mark for a very difficult task in mathematics at my class. And I was the only student who got this A mark. And you know what, I rushed, to my, I rushed home and told my father, Father, you know, I was the only one today who got this A mark for a very difficult task in mathematics. And you know what his reaction was? He said, and what? If you got B mark, you would have been punished. And you, uh, you got A mark, that's normal. And uh, you know, I was a little bit surprised. And only, I think, a decade later, I got that uh, uh, he loved me. And <laughs> he, his, reaction, his reaction, in fact, was that he wants me to study harder and better, and be better than anyone else. And that's how he expressed his love, in a very, maybe, strange way. But, <laughs> but uh, why I'm telling you this story? The reaction of my father 
for getting A mark in the difficult task of, of mathematics is very similar to the reaction of the OECD countries on what we are doing in my country for the uh, last decades. And uh, what I mean is that uh, OECD countries are hardly criticizing us for investment climate which we have now, which is definitely uh, have a big room to improve. But still, uh, I believe it's not that worse as uh, it's not that bad as its, uh, as its perception. And uh, I explain it only to one extent. This is because OECD countries love Russia and think that we are best student in uh, the class of market economy. And, uh, and I hope that we will remain the best beloved student. But seriously speaking, uh, let me tell you first of all where Russia is now. Just to remind you a few facts. First of all, we, we have economy growth of 4% and we expect around 4, 5, 3% in the upcoming decade. We have no forex control, as it was mentioned by Deputy Prime Minister Kudin today. We, are, unlike any other country, we are not even discussing the possibility of uh, introducing a special tax on banking or financial sector. Uh, even, uh, even more, uh, from the 1st of January of this year, we eliminated capital gain tax. Now, when, if you invest in Russia and keep shares for more than five years, there is no capital gain tax when you sell them. Uh, we, we had. We have quite low corporate taxes compared to OECD and BRIC countries. Uh, we have one digit inflation, which is a very important thing for my country because it first time it happened in 2009 and then in 2010. Before that, it was double digit inflation. And we have, I think, the lowest debt to GDP ratio among OECD and BRIC. It's around 10 or 11, depending on how you calculate it. Uh, about FDI inflow, we are still one of the best students in the class. Uh, the figure for the last year is 41.5 uh, billion US dollars. We're among BRIC, we're just number two, just after China, uh, and substantially and considerably ahead of uh, India and Brazil. Uh, but still, uh, we understand that the investment climate is poor still, we, and we have been improving it. And I'm going to present now what we're about to do and what we have done uh, and what we did uh, this year. First, uh, we declared a very big privatization program. And I can tell you, this is, in money terms, in dollar terms, this is the biggest privatization ever in our country. We're going to receive up to 30 billion US dollars uh, uh, in five years. And what is important, that in, in upcoming two months, we're going to declare the exact time schedule uh, for the upcoming three years. What company will be privatized, to which extent, and uh, in what year. Uh, second, uh, developing this idea of privatization. By the 1st of, uh, of October, uh, every state official will be removed from the board of directors of the state-owned companies. This was uh, uh, also discussed at the morning panel, but uh, this is going to be done. Uh, uh, an important thing for the foreign investment, last year we introduced an ombudsman office and our first deputy prime minister Shuvalov is an ombudsman for foreign investors and the minister of economy actually works as an ombudsman office and we have several success stories uh, how, we, how we treated foreign investors who were in the trouble uh, with uh, bureaucracy and uh, uh, examples of corruption. I can give you only one example but it's quite bright and quite sexy. It was IKEA company who declared last year that they're going to leave Russia forever and they're going to stop activity there because of few problems. We approached them, we, we got the problems, uh, most of them were resolved. Those which were not resolved, IKEA's top management in Sweden had to admit it was management fall and the management was sacked. And I can tell you that one month ago we met IKEA team and now we are discussing not their leave from Russia, we are discussing how many stores and in which cities they are opening and they are pushing us to uh, let them open them uh, quicker. And uh, uh, another thing which uh, I was discussing with IKEA management is the increasing of the level of local production uh, for the goods that they are selling through IKEA stores. And that's what we are now, just one, uh, one year uh, later than they, uh, they declared that they're going to leave. Now they, they're not going to leave. So this office works. Uh, what President 
uh, ordered to do that we are going to have a special ombudsman in every federal district at the position of the deputy to the representative of President of Russia in this disc district. Just to remind you, we have uh, uh, 85 regions, but we have uh, also the federal districts. And uh, they're going to be uh, the, uh, they're going to be a special ombudsman office for both Russian and foreign investors. They might apply with the problems again with bureaucracy and uh, state officials. We are not interfering in any deals and any problems between companies. We are not st substituting court system. But as soon as uh, the problem uh, arises from uh, uh, from bureaucracy or state, uh, federal or regional government, we will be there to help. Uh, second, uh, uh, and another point is that uh, this year we're going to set up a special investment fund. This is a quite unique institution because this investment fund will never invest itself. It will only invest, it will only co-invest together with a foreign investor. And this fund, the total commitment for this year will be 2 billion US dollars and the total commitment for the upcoming years will be 10 billion US dollars. The idea is that this fund is not substituting the, the environment and the institution we already have, but this is the, for the new type of clients. What I mean is private equity funds, because uh, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, uh, none of them had made any successful deal uh, in Russia so far. Uh, so this is quite a new type of clients for, uh, for Russian market. And another, uh, another type of client is the uh, sovereign wealth fund from Asia and from uh, Arabic world. So for them we're going to set up this institution. It will co-invest, we believe, not mo more than 50, up to 15% uh, of the project. And uh, this is to attract a new type of capital which is not uh, uh, already there in my country. Uh, Another point is that uh, unlike uh, like the United States, we have a very similar law like you guys have here, Exxon Florida Act, uh, protecting the uh, strategic sector from foreign investments, as I, as I may say. Uh, and uh, I can tell that the procedures are very similar to Exxon Florida, those procedures in Russia. But uh, uh, we have the only difference that we named the sectors which we consider to be strategic, unlike Exxon Florida, which says that any deal, if it threatens to some extent national security, can be subject to uh, a CFUS committee. But what we're going to do this year, we're going <coughs> to fully exempt IFC and EBRD uh, from, the, uh, from being subject to this law. Uh, that's what we're going to do uh, this spring or this summer. Uh, another thing is a uh, 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 few measures w which we did in tax sector. I, I already mentioned the capital gain tax, uh, which does make sense. What we also did, I think we are the only country among developed countries, we are introduced zero corporate tax rate for private businesses in healthcare and education. Our message is that come to the sector, create jobs, compete, we need a competition there, we need an increase of quality of services, earn money, we don't care how much you get. That's why we introduced for, for 10 years zero corporate tax uh, in the healthcare and education. We also substantially ease the migration procedures for so-called so -called high qualified specialists. High qualified specialist is anyone, any foreigner who makes more than 60,000 US dollars a year. Uh, this kind of person has a very simplified procedure for, uh, for getting a work permit and visa. And it, it, it started in December, uh, it's already, uh, it already works, I think now it's more than 3,000 uh, permits which were uh, granted under this uh, new procedure. Uh, we also, uh, we have a new customs environment, not only customs unit, uh, we also, the president signed the law on customs regulation uh, last December, and this is to ease the custom procedures, which we were hardly criticized for. And uh, we hope it's going to work. We don't, uh, of course, expect immediate effect, and we would really appreciate your feedback on uh, how it really works. And the last thing uh, I, I would like to mention is, uh, you might be surprised, Skolkovo project. Because Skolkovo project is not only the t to encourage innovation. That's the project started by uh, President Medvedev, very similar to Silicon Valley, if uh, somebody doesn't know. 
but this is uh, the Skolkov project differs from the any any other project in the world to the extent that the Skolkov area is almost there are, there will be almost no regulation there and this is to test this is to test what kind of regulations we can really get rid of in, in, in the whole country this is kind of not only innovation project but this is also a pilot project of uh, uh, getting rid of uh, many regulations uh, this is it uh, and we are not uh, we are we are not stopping uh, this is only a few measures which uh, will be done uh, this particular year and uh, I can tell you those of you who are interested in this uh, investing of, uh, together with the investment fund we're going to have a discussion of the investment declaration on 16th of June during the uh, St. Petersburg Economic Forum. It will be presented there. There are going to be two discussions separate, one for uh, private equity fund and investment banks, uh, another for sovereign wealth fund. Uh, and so uh, taking this chance, I am inviting all of you to visit St. Petersburg Economic Forum and I hope you will see how our country is changing. Thank you. We welcome a sharing of uh thoughts on that, where the process is headed, and uh, what could be done to try to promote positive outcomes. Okay, again, go to the microphone, identify yourself, and fire away. The lady in the back. Jenny used to know about Eurasia Group. Uh, my question is on the WTO accession. I'd like to um, first clarify technicality. Uh, what happens if Russia accedes to the WTO and Jackson Vanek is not repealed? Um, can the US Congress later repeal the Jackson Vanek? Would Russia then, would the bilateral agreement then revert back into force? That's the clarification. And then my question is, um, where do you think Russia is uh, in the accession process, and how likely is it still to exceed this year? Thank you. Yeah, you want to address that? Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a little reluctant to uh, say very much when I know there's some experts in the room who could uh, answer the question better than me, but this is my understanding. Um, when Russia uh, enters the WTO, if the Jackson Vanek remains in effect for Russia, we have to issue this notification of non-application, saying in effect, we're not going to extend PNTR, but we're not stopping Russia from, I mean, once the deal's been negotiated, they're in. Um, uh, my understanding, and I'm happy to be corrected by anyone here, that, that at any point down the, down the road, we can remove that, uh, lift Jackson Vanek with respect to Russia, and then enjoy the benefits of, um, of uh, mutual most favored nation PNTR status. So it's something that could be done and, and I suspect that if, we hope it doesn't happen, but that if uh, Jackson Bank isn't lifted in a timely way, then uh, eventually the pressure will build uh, on Congress to act because it will be then very evident that all it does is prevent the United States, which manufactures and exports high value added goods to Russia, is the one that is, uh, is, is, is harmed by that. Um, where, with respect to where Russia stands, and I'll, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll let uh, Stanislav correct me here, but um, I did hear, we've heard very different uh, versions. Uh, two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago, um, I met with the uh, Minister of uh, Economic Development, uh, Nabi um, and 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 she was quite confident and I think we also, if I recall, may have heard it from, from Deputy uh, Prime Minister Kudrin, that there's a very, very the, the Russians believe it's possible to achieve uh, a uh, conclusion of the negotiations by the end of June, beginning of July, in time to be able to submit it to the <coughs> General Council of the, uh, of the WTO. And then there would be a subsequent protocol signed, ratification by the State Duma, um, that maybe all of this conceivably could be done by July. Um, many, a number, a couple people in the room here who know better than me would also say uh, that, well, there is a lot more to the negotiations still than even those outstanding specific issues like 
uh, encryption technology and sanitary fee and sanitary standards. There is there are some 3,000 outstanding lines of the 16,000 or so lines in the uh, SITC that have been confused as a result of the creation of the customs union with Kazakhstan and Belarus, that there are no institutional procedures for resolving un uh, questions or ambiguities in the customs regulations even within the customs union. And that this all has to be resolved, a full package uh, has to be submitted um, and, and people on, uh, I think, on, on, on the other side of the negotiating table, ourselves and the Europeans, may be a little more uh, cautious about the prospects of getting it done. But what, we, what I hear, and there seems to be some political imperative to accomplish this, that this process will be concluded by the end of the year. I think, uh, I think Betsy Hafner, who runs the Russia desk at USTR, is here. Uh, and if you'd like to add anything on this, you can. Uh, I'll, also, I'll also look at Dorothy Dwoskin now at Microsoft, who used to handle all the WTO negotiations. She's shaking her head too. I don't know how come all these people are all of a sudden shrieking violence. <laughs> Not their normal course. That's the purpose of a trade organization. Would, would, would either of you like to uh, add any clarification to all this? Dorothy. So let me just say that there's nobody in the room that would like to see Russia accede to the WTO tomorrow more than myself, having spent, That's not true. 14, <laughs> years, having spent, having spent 14 years at it. And uh, as a company, Microsoft is very supportive of the accession. Um, but just in terms of the basic facts and the details, I think that um, Ed's comments about uh, all of the issues that are outstanding, this package obviously has to be reviewed not just in the US, but by all the other WTO members, and everybody has their own consultative process. And until you can actually look at this package, it's hard to basically take a decision um, as to what your position might be in the working party. So, you know, there's a transparency aspect to this and a consultation aspect to this. Um, and in the US, that involves uh, the US Congress. In other governments, um, it involves, you know, for example, I know the EU probably has a, a rather lengthy process and other governments uh, will look at this, you know, very, very seriously. So the sooner um, all of these issues get resolved, the sooner the package um, can get out and people can take a look at it. But technically, there's work to be done. A general council meeting can be called at any time. So there's no magic to July except they have a regularly scheduled meeting of the general council. What is what's your best judgment, Dorothy, on uh, on likely timing? You know, <laughs> that's not one that I want to bet on, and I didn't for a while. Thank you. <laughs> just just on, on one technical point that's been raised, uh, <laughs> and you all make sure if I've got it right, um, if Russia joins, and we do not repeal Jackson Vanek and provide PNTR. It's then up to, the, and we have to file this uh, uh, declaration of non-application. That's clear. But then it's up to the Russians whether they would go ahead anyway and extend the benefits of their W-2 accession to us or not. They have the option. They could go ahead either ignoring what we do or assuming we're going to do it at some point. But there would be then a continued uncertainty over the whole process. And so our trade, our investment would be clouded by that uncertainty. In addition, our political relations would, of course, be affected if the US did not take the requisite action to implement its side of the WTO accession process. But let me make sure that's right. You're shaking your head on that. Um, I, I have to ask for forgiveness for my colleagues uh, from the administration, but um, there have been situations where the U.S. has had to invoke non-application at the time uh, a, a government has um, had an action before the, the general counsel. And what will happen um, is 
that when uh, the U.S. is in a position to um, provide unconditional MFN, which is PNTR, then you can actually resubmit uh, the papers to do that. Russia will have its own timetable as to what, after the general counsel takes an action on the package, Russia will have to go back and um, do what it needs to do and then deposit its instrument of ratification. Um, the United States and Russia have a bilateral trade agreement from 1992 um, that uh, provides for MFN treatment now, and that still would, would apply. I wouldn't want to guess as to how the Russians would look at the timing of deposit of their instrument of ratification or, or other issues. It's, it's complicated, but we still have, we do have an MFN relationship with Russia as a result of the bilateral trade agreement which, from which could continue, Which could continue. But you don't know, and there's a there's a degree of uncertainty. I'm not undermining the case for PNTR application, but just to make sure that people understand the facts. Yes. Just can I add just one fact? Uh, and Betsy really should be talking. But my name is Michael <laughs> McFall. I, I I work at the National Security Council. That is true, Fred. But um, there's a lot more in the. WTO package that's not in the bilateral treaty. So there's a lot of stuff, particularly on the services, particularly on the rules on IPR, uh, particularly on uh, what we can do if we see violations. That's that that you know why have we been negotiating for 18 years? Because we want something better than than is in that trade. So I think that's important for people to understand. All of that stuff we would we would be uh, uh, we would not have. Well, there could be a negotiation. I don't think there would be. I also want to say this, this whole conversation really troubles me because rather than thinking about all the ways that we can avoid this, we should be focusing on getting Jackson Vanek done. Uh, and so I would just encourage you to spend less time thinking about this and more time figuring out a way to, collectively with us to get that done. That's a win-win for everybody. So. Okay, floor is open. Yes, Toby. commenced us for his list of steps that are taken, which I think is really very significant. Um, but um, And it will be relevant to some of the debate about the repeal of Jackson Vanek, but it's not relevant to some of the other steps that Congress might take. And I guess because you're all economists, you're not talking about that here, but there's going to be a debate over a body that's going to be created after um, uh, if we get repeal. But, and here the Chinese, I think, uh, example probably is relevant. A uh, U.S. China Commission of some sort on economic and security relations, I don't know. And I wonder, um, uh, has the business community or others who might influence that debate been thinking about it? Because I agree uh, with Mike that this debate is uh, uh, very narrow and we really ought to be thinking about U.S.-Russia relations uh, in a broader sense than just uh, the repeal of Jackson Vanek. I know that's what we do uh, and you know what you guys do for a living, but I think the relationship is what's going to determine in, in large part the level of investment and the level of confidence in Russia. And um, I'd like to just broaden it out so that we're prepared as are other groups and as are Russians who are concerned about developments in Russia and human rights and in democracy about where we're going to be headed uh, after if we get repeal. Well, we'll regard that as something of a comment, uh, more than a question, although if anybody wants to respond, or if Mike would want to respond, then you're going to respond in a few minutes. Yeah. And Sergey, of course. Sounds like. Toby, you know, we are doing this not for American Congress. Yeah. We are doing this to improve investment climate because we are betting on investments as one of the drivers for the upcoming economy growth. Stanislav, could I just ask you, uh, how does Russia's accession to the WTO affect what you are doing, or does it support what you're trying to do anyway in terms of strengthening the investment climate? Uh, tell us about the relationship between those two things. We consider WTO as a very good brand. You know, it's like it's been important to be there. That's all. And uh, this is definitely. Uh, uh, that's what I'm, for example, uh, you might understand that there are some uh, op uh, op uh, opposition from Russian companies to WTO because they're afraid that they become less competitive. But I say no, you become more competitive because 
the WTO exception, uh, accession, I, I believe, immediately opens uh, uh, a very good chance for more capital to come, for more investments. So that's how we consider it from the investment point of view, because this is my uh, area of coverage. Right. Okay. Um, oh, sure. Ed, go ahead. I mean, <clears throat> when, when, it, when we get around to debating Jackson Bannock uh, in Congress, uh, I, I expect we'll be making the economic trade related arguments and looking at it from a very pragmatic perspective. But I expect that uh, there will be people um, both within the committees of jurisdiction and in the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations who will be turning us into a debate really about Russia, a referendum. Um, and a lot of issues are going to come up in that process and I, I suspect that's going to be, a, a, we're going to have to do some management of that and it may have some repercussions on our bilateral relationship. Uh, issues that will come up, and I can cite one very specific, was already mentioned earlier, um, uh, the Sergei Magnitsky case. There is an act, uh, now a, 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 a bill, it's been authored by, uh, by Senator Cardin, a uh, Democrat of Maryland, uh, calling for very tough uh, sanctions against uh, individuals who were implicated in the uh, death of Sergei Magnitsky. Um, I suspect that there are going to be bills like that which will be um, seen as substitutes for Jackson Vanek. Jackson Vanek isn't fit for purpose. It only has one thing. It says free immigration of peoples. That exists. You can't hold them to that standard anymore. But there will be others that will crop up. But they won't be impediments to improving our trade and economic relationship, except that they may create a more, um, let's say, contentious political environment. Andy, you want to weigh on that? And uh, uh, wow, well, there's your mic right there. Um, yeah, just Andy Kutchin, CSIS. Uh, I think as part of the Russia balance sheet project, uh, we have plans to do something uh, similar uh, to what we're doing today with the on the economic side, but looking at the U.S.-Russia relationship and what exactly the reset has entailed and what it has brought. Uh, now, the, this discussion only tells me that. Uh, it is more imperative to do that uh, than uh, I, had, I had thought, and so we will be consulting about the, when precisely is the right time to do that, whether it would be before um, July or in the, uh, in the fall. But this has always been a part of our view of what we do in uh, 2011 with the, with the project. I host a, a conference of this magnitude at CSIS that would look at, well, what has the reset brought? And Mike will certainly be talking about that in his remarks. Um, I have uh, two comments, if I may. The one uh, that actually I had a chance also to discuss uh, a couple of weeks or a few weeks ago with some of uh, participants of this panel. I would say that just I am I cannot hide my uh, uh, that I cannot kind of just how much I. I'm amazed by the discussions of the last several months on these issues of the Russia's accession to WTO to establishing a normal trade relations with the United States with asymmetry, clear asymmetry between two sides, US on one side and Russia on the other side. How much interest, energy, time, efforts of all kinds have been invested on the U.S. side into this business and how just it's rather hard to mention any interest from the Russian authorities in this business. Just we have here a wonderful report why it is in the U.S. interest to establish normal trade relations with Russia. I haven't seen anything like why it is in the Russia's interest to establish normal trade relations with the U.S. and to and to WTO, and just even with all due respect to our great uh, representative from the Russian side, even today, only uh, Deputy Prime Minister mentioned once and Sergei mentioned once uh, interest in WTO, but not much, even from that. And the comment from Stanislav seems to me it's like a cold shower about the WTO right now, about that. And I'm just really some kind of uh, surprised and puzzled uh, by this asymmetry. Tangi can be danced by two, 
We have now is very much interest partner, one partner, but looks like the other one is not so much interest. And the other uh, comment uh, that if I may, or even just even suggestion, uh, Stanislav, you have done uh, looks like a great job at very much in the uh, uh, in the area of improvement of the mass climate. If I may just suggest a few other issues that seems to me uh, would uh, would work in the same direction. You mentioned uh, working visa for foreigners to work in Russia. I have not heard anything about the working visa for Robert, Robert Dudley uh, from British Petroleum that seems to me has been cancelled in July year 2008. It is still there. It is still cancelled. Oh, how this issue has been solved. seems to be some kind of solution of that problem would contribute to improvement of the investment climate in Russia. Also seems to me that if William Browder would get his visa back to Russia, it would help as well, as well as investigation of Sergei Magnitsky case and the return of uh, VAT to the Russian budget. It is very strange that return of the VAT in the Russian budget could be helpful for the establishing investment climate in Russia. Release of Mr. Khodorkovsky in Platon Lebedev, surprise, surprise, also could help. And I would continue, and probably you know the, all these issues and many other issues that have been held. I do understand that probably it's not everything in your personal power, but uh, it's the power of the Russian authorities. And we're talking about the investment climate and the membership in some important organizations. I think those issues should not be forgotten. Thank you. I'm going to react. Uh, I, I, I hope. Uh, I hope to, not to overreact. Uh, first, there is no asymmetry. Uh, for example, I can tell from my personal experience, the, uh, WTO is not my uh, area of coverage formally, but I'm here not only for World Bank meeting. On Monday, we are having, together with the US uh, government, a group uh, of uh, protection of intellectual property rights, which, un which surprisingly remains the issue, surprisingly, because I think we did we did our best. For example, just one technical detail, but very important. We introduced so-called data exclusivity concept in our legislation, which has been an outstanding issue for a decade with the U.S.-Russia uh, uh, relations. And we will continue to do more, and we're going to discuss not even legislation on Monday, but uh, more enforcement thinking, how we all move together. So I think uh, there is no asymmetry, and Maxim Medvedkov, who is our negotiator from Moscow, if you tell him that he, that he is not a, a part of the dance, I, I, I don't know, he's a part of the gym exercises or whatever, because he doesn't sleep, I think. He lives in Geneva, he, li he, he visits the United States uh, more, more than anyone else, and I think the, the team has been doing a brilliant job and very outstanding. I can only uh, applaud. Uh, about about the investment climate measures you mentioned, uh, about Bob Dudley, uh, Bob Dudley, I don't know, uh, I don't think it's an outstanding issue now. Uh, I haven't heard that he still have a problem. Uh, I doubt that he has. Uh, second, about um, uh, about Bill Browder, I can I, I can only I can only add that uh, uh, a few facts. Uh, and you remember the answer of Mr. Shuvalov to uh, Bill Browder, who had personal opportunity to ask the question in, uh, during Davos Forum to, uh, to the Russian delegation, and he got the answer. And I can only, can only add that uh, 36 people were sacked uh, after this case, and, and you know uh, personally that there is an, an investigation of this case, because from the human being point of view, it, it, it's a tragedy what happened in jail and uh, the Russian authorities uh, do understand that, and, uh, and, they're, and they, uh, they are reacting, we are reacting. Uh, so I think we should not speculate uh, some, some things. In, in any country there are problems. The, the important thing is how the problems are, are sorted out by the government. Thank you. Okay, yes. Uh, my name is Doug Palmer. I work for Reuters, and I had a question for Mr. Verona. Um, I, 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 you know, I understand that it's an executive branch decision whether to sign off on the accession package and let um, Russia into the WTO. I just wondered. I mean, do you think it's politically possible um, for 
Congress to vote and approve um, PNTR before the accession package is completed and everybody knows what's, what's in it. I refer back <clears throat> to what Dorothy said. It's a very complex process. There are, there are steps involving consultation. There are uh, time periods in which uh, documents have to be uh, filed with the Secretariat of the WTO. I mean, I suppose it's theoretically possible that when a deal has been struck that those consult consultations could occur very quickly and that the debate could be, could be uh, shortened and made, you know, with a very you know, tight time frame, there could be a debate and then it could be voted up or down. And maybe that would be the way to do it. Um, I just sense that this probably needs uh, this issue uh, uh, needs to it needs to marinate uh, in on Capitol Hill. I just don't know how for how for how long. And I will say this, and this uh, and and uh, I think it's the administration's job to make a very strong case for WTO, not just because of the economic benefits, which frankly, I mean, given the volumes of trade we have, probably don't move the needle in the trade debate. They have to make the case from a geopolitical perspective. What's at stake? Why it's important to have Russia inside the club, not just because it's a good brand, that's a good reason, but because it also provides a structure, a framework, and reassurance to, in, to investors and companies, again, make commitments for long-term trading relationship with Russia. Um, and I think uh, that's just something that the administration has to do. We're very happy that uh, Vice President Biden went to uh, Moscow last month, and he very unequivocally said that the, US, the administration supports Russia's WTO accession. The administration's policy is to lift Jackson Vanek with respect to Russia. And further, he said that he, former chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, would be the point man uh, on getting this through Congress. And, um, and I, I, I hope we'll hear more about that at lunchtime. But that's my, my sense of it. It's conceivable, but I wish we could get it moving more quickly. Um, so that it doesn't have to turn into a full-flown debate right when we're trying to get something done quickly. Okay. Again, just to reiterate what I said earlier, the administration has now said repeatedly that it wants to get that done this year. It's on the trade policy agenda. Uh, that's been reiterated uh, now repeatedly and with increasing fervor, I would say. And uh, so uh, the declaration of intent uh, is certainly strong. Further questions? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Thompson. I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition of Intellectual Property Rights. And I'd like to say to Mr. Voskodosinski, I would be very pleased to hear that in your up-and-coming discussions with the U.S. government, you're going to focus on enforcement-related activities. I can tell you after years and years working on these matters with many of the people in this room that uh, intellectual property obviously is a huge issue you know, with respect to the WTO accession. It is also obviously in the best interest of the Russian Federation to have better intellectual property rights protections to advance the policy agendas that you're looking at with respect to modernization, Skolkova, and so forth. I would also add that efforts that could be undertaken to advance better enforcement practices will have a large impact on the debate that's going on today in the United States, particularly with the U.S. Congress. I fully understand that what's being done by the Russian Federation is not being done to please the U.S. Congress. It's being, it's being done to help the Russian Federation, and that's perfectly legitimate. But I would say to you that efforts that can be taken where there's some real substantive efforts to improve enforcement will have a decided impact on this debate that we're talking about today. And I wish you luck on your discussions on Monday. Thank you, sir. Can I also add, because uh, about the intellectual property right, uh, we know that there is debate in the Congress that we are poor in law enforcement. But I can only give you one example, and you will, uh, you will treat it yourself. In 2010, six American movies, the top movies, like Shrek, Tourist, and others, for these movies, Russia was number two market just after the United States in terms of official revenue. What kind of intellectual property abuse we are speaking about in Russia? We uh, American companies got more than uh, more than from European market, even from Russian market, officially official revenues. That's that's uh, the best example how we really push the enforcement. So I think uh, I would really appreciate if the people in Congress. 
uh, stopped bullshitting about uh, intellectual property rights in Russia and relying on facts, only on facts. You put it clearly. Uh, 